Welcome to Be Your Own Best Coach with JJ. Today, we're going to be talking about stop self-medicating with alcohol and feel. Stop self-medicating with alcohol and allow yourself to feel. Now, if I ask you guys a question, and there's a reason why you're listening today. So maybe it's for you. Maybe you're just a bit curious about what I'm going to say or maybe it's because there's someone in your life that you think maybe there might be a bit of an issue with alcohol but I want to ask you guys a question and my first question is what is an alcoholic what is an alcoholic now it's interesting when you ask that question because even if you google it right if you google it uh there's all these different explanations about what an alcohol is Uh, alcoholic is and you might say okay well an alcoholic is someone that drinks a lot or you might say an alcoholic is somebody that drinks a lot every day you might even if you think of a picture if you get an image in your head of what an alcoholic look looks like you probably think of somebody that's maybe roaming the streets they're drunk they don't know what they're doing they might even have you know the bottle in the in the brown paper bag roaming the streets you might have that type of image when you think of an alcoholic but you may not necessarily have an image of a highly functioning leader a highly functioning successful person who shows up every day who looks okay who gets great results who might be a mother a father a CEO of a business, and you might see them and have a few drinks and have a few laughs and never really think that they may have a problem. And so I want to explore this with you guys because when I look at what I think an alcoholic is, it is somebody in my mind that is dependent on alcohol in some way. Now I'm going to ask you a question. Those of you that drink alcohol, what about if I said to you to stop alcohol right now? Just stop it. Just stop. No more alcohol. What do you think? What comes up for you? Do you say to yourself, oh, hold on, (laughs) but I like alcohol, (laughs) but I want to keep drinking alcohol. Do you say, oh, but but it's great. I just, you know, I, I don't over drink. So why would I have to give up alcohol? I don't want to give up alcohol. Are you coming up for your excuses to say, no, I must have it in some way? Or is it, okay, well, if I have to give up, I'll just give up. It doesn't worry me either way. The thing is most people are dependent on alcohol because if you've come up with all these excuses of holding on to it, I love it, I enjoy it, I don't overuse it. But if I say it's only a liquid substance, right? (laughs) I'm drinking a cup of coffee right now. It's only a liquid substance. So it's like it's only a liquid substance. So if if I say just get rid of it, just get rid of it. Can you get rid of it? But when you're holding on to it, there is some form of dependency to that alcohol. So I want to explore that a little bit with you guys. We often, when we talk about self-medicating, when you think about alcohol or any other type of drug, whether it be pills, whether it be marijuana, whether it be any other hard drugs, when people are self-medicating, it could be because they're, they're, they're really suppressing their feelings in some way. So maybe they're anxious. Maybe they're worried. Maybe they are stressed. Maybe they just want a bit of confidence. They're about to do a speech or meet their new date for the first time and they say to themselves, I want some Dutch courage. And so they just think I'll just have a nip of a drink and that'll get me over the line. They could be grieving. You could be in pain. And so that alcohol is seen as, okay, it can help me in some way. 
But the news flash is, and you probably already know this, that alcohol is a depressant. So even though initially it might feel that it's helping you because it numbs you, that's what it does, it numbs. And if it's that Dutch courage you want, oh, it, it, you know, it gets into you, know, you feel like a different person, you get that, oh, but at the end of the day, it is a depressant. So what comes up must come down. And when you're having alcohol as a as something that is you're self-medicating, what you're doing is you're suppressing your feelings, which means you're not feeling. And if you do it often enough, you can forget how to feel into those types of emotions. And you lose that clarity of thought. So you live in numbness and you disconnect from yourself. It's really interesting because I had my mastermind group over at my house, a really great, amazing, amazing group of people came to my house for lunch and I asked them some challenging questions and I was asking them questions and some that the, the ones that agreed would go on one side of the room and the ones that disagreed would go on the other side of the room. And I asked them all different questions about the world. And one of the questions I asked is, is it bad to drink alcohol? And it was interesting to see because most people, except I think for one person, said, no, it's not. And they went to the room, the side of the room that said, no, it's not bad to, to drink alcohol. But I wonder, and it didn't surprise me because society tells us it's okay, right? It even says it's an antioxidant. It even says that one or two is pretty good. And I'm sure if you Googled to say, what are the benefits of alcohol, you would find them, right? The reality is that it's a toxic poison. That is the reality. And I wonder if I said that in my room, if I said, who thinks that consuming a toxic poison is a good thing to do? And I'm sure most of them or all of them, I, I would hope, would go to the side of the room to say, shit, no, I don't want to be having a toxic poison in my body. But society tells us that it's okay. It tells us it's okay. And the interesting thing that I, I, I want to ask you guys, and as I said, you might be listening for all different reasons, but I want to ask you the question, is it serving you? If you're drinking alcohol, is it serving you or not? Is it helping you towards your goals or is it putting you back from your goals? Is it really taking you in a different direction? And I've coached a lot of people that have had challenges with alcohol and other substances. So I want to just explore what, what that alcohol is because it is a poison and it's a drug. It's toxic. It negatively affects all of your nerve cells. It affects your brain. It affects how you think. It affects how you behave. It, 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 fogs, your, uh, it fogs your mind. So you don't have clarity around your thinking and decisions. It can give you liver damage. And when I say it can, it damages your liver every time you're, whether it be a sip, whether it be a glass, whether it be a bottle, each time you consume alcohol, it's a toxic poison. So it doesn't matter what amount that you have, it still is damaging to your body. It causes cancer. It increases your blood pressure so you can get high blood pressure it affects every part of your body from your skin to your eyes to your nails to your hair every organ in your body it's toxic and that's the reality you can't get away from that yet society tells us not only that it's okay that it's good and it teaches us how good it is. I remember going to Germany 
and being on a train. And it wasn't Oktoberfest or anything like that when we went. But there was a whole group of teenagers came and they're drinking beer and, and I'm looking around at the adults and they're like, it's like it's normal. It's just normal. That's what we do. And then first thing in the morning we go to a cafe for breakfast and people are drinking their beer, their alcohol for their breakfast because that's the culture. Now every culture is different. I live in Australia and the cult, we have a big drinking culture too. If we're celebrating, if we're commiserating, alcohol's there. So you might begin going to a wedding, an engagement, a football match, a birthday, a christening. You celebrate that new job. But you might commiserate as well, right? Might be times where there's funerals, alcohol will be there. When you just want to relax, alcohol can be there. When you're grieving, alcohol can be there. And when you've had a hard day, come on, you deserve that glass of wine on that hard day, don't you? Or not. And I think about the 18th birthday, so I don't know where you guys are from in, in the world, but legal age here in Australia is 18. And it's so exciting, isn't it, for parents? That, and I see it on social media. Yay, my kid's going to be 18. Let's take him to the first drink down the pub and put that toxic liquid into their body so they can start straight away when they're 18 and so that they can extend that for the rest of their life. And we think we're doing the right thing. My son, when he was 17, we went to Thailand. And even though he wasn't at legal age to drink, we, we had our own pool. We said, oh, let's, let's get, you know, have a little sip of some beer. And I was so excited to be able to give that to him. Fortunately, my, my son wasn't into it. But when he was 18, again, I've got this beer set of all these beers from, from around the world and a big beer glass and like, happy 18th. And I think about that now and I freaking cringe because what am I teaching him? I'm following the culture that I think is right. And we are so freaking conditioned to say that this is what we do. You watch any movie nearly now, any TV series, and what are they doing? Exactly that. They are drinking a lot. They're drinking to celebrate. They're drinking to commiserate. You know, they get you see these ladies in the movies and they've got their glass and they get the bottle and they just pour out the bottle and they throw it down. And that's how it is, isn't it? And they're conditioning our thinking all of the time. And it affects our behaviour. And it's like this chain reaction because we've learned it from somewhere. We learn from our society. We learn from TV. We learn from our family. And it's like these chains that are all linked together. These chains are linked together, as I know, for, for my family, my beautiful dad who I adored, who I lost when I was 17, was a big drinker, right? It was a big drinker. Mum, not interested in, in, in alcohol at all, but Dad was. And so unconsciously he taught me that that's okay and that's just how people are. Some people drink, some people don't, and it's all good. And so you learn this from a young age, whether it was your parents, whether it be your brother, sister, and combined with the culture of the society that you are brought up with and the conditioning of the media and the TV shows that you watch. So you suddenly say that that's okay. And so it comes from wherever that comes from, your mum, your dad, whatever, you say that's okay, so you start it. And then, then before long, 
your kids are all looking at you and you're saying, happy 18th, here's your beer. And then they pass it on to their family and they pass it on because that's how it is, all these little links to the chain until someone actually says, hey, I know better. I know better. And they break the link because they understand that all it is is a toxic substance and a liquid that is damaging to the body and that you don't want your family consuming it. I remember a beautiful man who my husband used to work with, lovely man, big heart, very good in business, and he had a very successful business for a very, very long time. And he then, when he got into financial trouble after a very, very long time, his business for over 30 years or something like that, uh, and, and it was a family business. So they were in business for a long, long, long time. And he lost everything. Now, initially, <coughs> he was a, a big drinker anyway. So he would, you know, for parties, he'd see him and, and you'd always know he'd, he'd drink a fair bit. And... But when the shit hit the fan, and everything went downhill for his business. He lost all, he had many homes, he had many cars, he had the boat, he had the holidays, he had the kids in private school. He lost everything. And when he did, he self-medicated with alcohol. And he went down this track. And I remember saying to my husband, please tell him that I'm here to have a conversation for him at any time that he wants. And I was really fearful of what was going to happen. And so my husband told him and he said, thank you so much. I'm okay. I'm dealing I'm dealing with things, um, but thank you anyway and I'll keep that in mind. His doctor said to him, if you keep drinking alcohol, you will die. And that's exactly what happened. And he was only in his early early 50s. His wife also self-medicated. And again, I reached out to a family member this time and I said, please let me help her. And the family member had told me that she was locked herself in, her, in the house that she was staying in that she was just living like a squatter, like really, you know, in terrible circumstances and she won't open the door. And I said, I don't care. I will be there. Get some intervention. If it's not me, get somebody else. I'm happy to go there. I'll knock on the door. Let me in. Get me in there. I don't care if she's drunk. I'll be there to support in any way I can. And her family member said, again, okay, well, we'll, we're dealing with it right now. If we need you, we'll let you know. And it was probably a month later that she passed away too and they left behind children. And it was devastating for me. It was so devastating, these beautiful human beings. They had a tough time. They had a tough time in life and they self-medicated in those in those times and I wonder where the kids are going to be in the chain are the kids in the chain and are they going to be saying no no more this is it I am not allowing this to happen in my family or are they continuing the chain and even adding more to that chain with their kids and their grandkids When you self-medicate, you lose the ability to feel and to address the issues in your life. It's challenging, right, because when you stop drinking, you have to deal with life. But you can learn to do that. And 
the thing is when people are self-medicating they think that that it's it's squashing the problem but it's what it's doing it's expanding it because yes you're numbing it at them at that moment but you're also adding on to it you might feel shame afterwards uh guilt you might do some things that you wouldn't have done if you hadn't been drinking. Now, I don't mean somebody that's completely blind drunk. You could just have one drink and you're not you're not thinking clearly. Now, I had a client who had no idea what she was doing and she'd walked out in the middle of the night in her pyjamas for no reason. And so the, the, the safety of people is so, so important. And you do stuff when you've been drinking that you wouldn't have done before. And it can affect every area of your life. Now, I know that you might sound think that things are extreme and maybe you're, you're thinking, well, no, it's not, it's serving me. I can drink. And cool, if you eat. The great thing about life is that we have our own free will. What I'm highlighting is the ability to be able to say what's serving you in your life and what's not. And the reality is that alcohol is a poison, whether we like it or not. <laughs> the thing is if we want to shift if we want to get away from drinking alcohol, it's an, it's an identity shift. It can be a challenge. Now, I know for me, five years ago, and I wasn't drinking every night, <clears throat> but five years ago, I said to myself, I'm going to do a bit of a detox. And part of that was uh, coffee and uh, drinking more water, uh, exercising. And then I said, I think I'll just have a break from alcohol for a month. Now, the thing was, even though I wasn't drinking every night, I found it challenging. Come Friday, I was like, I want my glass of wine because it was part of who I thought I was. You know, I was the person on Friday who would do a social media post, oh, it's wine o'clock today. And I think it was freaking funny. It's not funny. Because I'm a leader, I'm a coach, and I'm, I, and I'm saying to every coach out there that what we do matters. And so even if we think that's fine, it's not fine because we're telling people that it's okay to consume a toxic, poisonous substance. And I was doing that as a coach. I cringe when I think about that. But it was so part of my identity and I love to cook. Those of you that know me, I love, I'm a passionate cook. So I'd be making dinner and having a glass of wine and I love to travel. So we'd travel around the world and, and go to wineries and wine tasting and it was such a part of who I thought I was. So when I decided to give it a break for a month, it was like someone chopped my bloody arm off, right? And I had no, no idea and no, no inclination, even a thought that I would ever give it up for good because that wasn't why I was doing it. I was just having a break, giving up for a month, uh, cleansing my body, and then I'll get straight back into it. <laughs> but the thing was I found so much that I really learned about myself and I learned about society. In that month, I learned when I would go somewhere, people would say, oh, God, just have a drink. Come on, just this once. And so I had people self trying to self-sabotage me. And I'm like, what's that about? Why can't they just be happy that I'm not drinking for a month? Why are they wanting me to drink? Right? What's it to them if I drink? If I drink a different substance that they've, that, than they've got in their glass what's the difference? And then I have people saying, oh, you're going to be no fun. And I'm like, I'm fun. Fun's my middle name. What are you talking about? The alcohol doesn't make me fun. I am fun. That's who I am. <laughs> right? 
And some people were feeling a bit uncomfortable that I haven't got a drink. What's that got to do? It's a liquid substance. It's just a different liquid substance that I've got in my glass. And then I started observing people that were drinking and how their behaviour changes. And I'm not talking someone that, that has, you know, a lot to drink and suddenly they're blind. But I'm talking about someone that has one glass of wine or two glasses of wine and I can see the difference. It's like they're, they're saying stuff that they probably wouldn't say. Their eyes look different. Even their speech is different. And I'm thinking, gee, wow, I didn't know. Really, I'm just really observing and seeing the difference that alcohol has on people. And I was observing it. And so as the time went on, there were a couple of things that I found really, really challenging. One was society and the people around me. And so that was like, wow, I kept having to push back. The other was that I didn't realise how much I was using alcohol as a self-medication because the times I wanted it the most was when I had a tough day and I thought, I just want to relax. And it's like, I can't have that. So I found that challenging. And when there were challenges in my life that I had to sit and work through rather than take the edge off with a glass of wine. And the more I did that and the more I saw that that was happening, even though it was challenging, it was such an aha moment for me because I thought as a coach that I was really in control of my mindset and I freaking wasn't because the alcohol was numbing me in some way. And so I decided after a month to keep going. But the interesting thing was, as I was deciding whether I wanted to have alcohol again in my life, and I was exploring that, that option, the months went by and it would have been probably six months into not drinking at all, how great I started feeling. And I, and I was looking at all things that started to change, like even just the look of my eyes looked different. And the interesting thing was I couldn't say out of my mouth that I'm not a non-drinker. I would say stuff like someone say, oh, do you want to drink? I'd say, I'm not drinking at the moment. I kept saying at the moment. And that was really challenging for me to say I'm a non-drinker. Why? Because my identity kept wanting to keep a part of the old me. It was like, oh, let's hold on to that, hold on to that. I'm scared to not, you know, hold on to that. I'm scared to actually say I'm never going to drink in my life. But then something shifted where it became part of me and it was like, you know what, this is who I am. I am a non-drinker. That is who I am. And I started saying it and it came out of my mouth. It became who I who I was. But it was a journey, guys, and I get some of you that may be challenged right now and listening. It might feel like it's chopping off your arm. And, and I wish I could say to you that it's not going to be challenging because it is challenging. <laughs> it is. Any identity shift is challenging but it's so freaking worth it. And the thing is that I, it's so important for us to empower ourselves and empower others and be our own best coach. And so whatever whatever happened in the past in regards to you, know, you might have tried to stop drinking, that, that was the past. Today is another day. And your past doesn't dictate your future. And you are not your behaviour. That isn't who you are. So right now it can be the time where you make a different decision of who you want to be and who you want to become. So for those of you who 
have decided, yes, this is for me, I want to make a change. I'm going to give you some different techniques that I think are really important. So for those of you that say, yep, I want to make a change, I want to give up, this is what I would say for you to do. Number one is get support. Support is crucial. Now, when I say support, particularly if you are someone that is drinking a lot, it is really important to see a doctor because if you're if you just stop drinking, it can be dangerous. I've been told. So make sure that uh, that is part of your program is speaking to a doctor, and they can let you know how to go about giving up. But also, the other support people are the people around you. So those people around you. You might have a, a drink, your best friend could have been your drinking partner, your, your your partner, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your your friend's network, friend network. Make sure that when you make that decision, you get their support. You ask them, you have a serious conversation with them and say, this is what I'm, I've decided, this is important to me. I am no longer wanting to drink alcohol. I don't want it part of my life. I know that perhaps they they want to drink. So you might say, I know that it's a big part of your life and I respect your choices. But for me, this is very important for me and I don't want to drink alcohol anymore. That isn't the person that I want to be. And then say to them, can I have your support? And then tell them what that support looks like. So the support might be, when I come to your house, please make sure that you don't ask me for alcohol. Ask me if I want to drink. Please ensure that, you know, you support me, that you cheer me on. Can you do that for me? And, uh, and talk to them about how you would love them to support you. It's so important because your environment is a huge influence on you. Now, that, that doesn't mean I, cut my, I had my girlfriend, one of my girlfriends, and we used to have margaritas, and it's like, oh, margaritas, uh, and you used to have fun. And the, the great thing is that you can still have mocktail margaritas, right? You don't have to change everything. You can still make a, a change and still have that fun that you always did. But it's up to you to decide how you want to change your environment. So there might be things that you don't do. You might have uh, normally go to the pub on every Friday and you might say, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to stop that. But your tribe are really important. So make sure that you look at your tribe, think about the people that you want on your support team and ask them for support. And then there also might be people that you, you might go, you know what, I just don't think that they're gelling with my future anymore and you might not see those people as much anymore. I mean, that's totally up to you. Now, the other thing is about changing your habit because it's a habit. You're used to it, right? Friday, just like I said, I'm cooking, I get my glass of wine, cooking, and then that was just part of what I did. So what you might want to do is, well, the first thing you want to do is when you change a habit, you make it invisible. You know when you've got those chocolates on your on your kitchen bench or your bicky or the cakes that you that you made and it's sitting there on the kitchen bench and you walk past and you go, ooh, and the cake's going, hello, hello, do you want some cake? You want some chocolate? And you're like, ooh, I know. And you keep looking at the cake, it's like, mm. and it's like, hello, I'm tasty. You want some? You want some, don't you? And every time you're looking at it, it's right there for temptation. It is visible. So make it invisible. Get it out so you don't even see it. <laughs> make it invisible. Make it unattractive. I don't know. If someone's having something, you just make it look, be unattractive. Make it difficult to have. So don't have it in your house. If you've got it in your house, make sure it's locked up in the back fridge or, I don't know, 
But if you can, don't have it in your house at all. So it's difficult that you have to actually get in your car and drive and get it. And make it unsatisfying. So when I say unsatisfying, Google all the shit out of how bad alcohol is for you. Get images of it. Have images. Have a look at a, a liver that's damaged compared to a, a healthy liver. Have a look at somebody that that uh, was looking fantastic and then they were an alcoholic and compare the photos. Look at their skin. Look at their eyes. Look at their hair. Have a look at the damage that it does for you and look at stories. Make it unsatisfying. And the last thing is do a habit swap because when you take out a habit, there's a little hole there. It's like there's nothing there. So take, you're taking out that habit, but fill it with something else. So maybe that Friday, instead of having that drink, you get home, put your runners on and you go for a run if that's something that you love. For me, initially, what I did was I substituted because I love the whole gesture, right? I love, I love the gesture of the glass, filling it up, holding it. I loved that whole feeling. And so for me, it was important to still have that. So initially I had mineral water <laughs> with lemon. It, just, it didn't really do it for me. Then when we went overseas, I'd have mocktails and I was having a ball. The mocktails are so amazing, guys. I don't know. I'm just like, how come I never had mocktails before? <laughs> so I'd have mocktails. And then I... I found as the years went by, then there was non-alcoholic wine and uh, which had, uh, and be careful because some non-alcoholic wine has lots of sugar, same with the mocktails. But there are some great non-alcoholic wines that have no alcohol that have all the antioxidants and are low in sugar and they're like a quarter of the calories of alcohol. And so we went to Spain and I had amazing wine, non-alcoholic wine there. I had amazing mocktails. We went to Sri Lanka, same thing. We went to Germany. You now you have non-alcoholic beers. I don't drink beer, uh, but we have. there's non-alcoholic beer. There's non-alcoholic cider. There's non-alcoholic spirits like Liars, L-Y-R-E-S, is a fantastic brand for uh, non-alcoholic spirits. So I substituted and I can tell you right now, I never, ever felt that I was missing out, ever, because I got my substitute. Often, even on social media, people people might message me and say, I thought you weren't drinking. And I'm like, what do you mean? I saw that glass. I'm like, oh, shit, no, that that's non-alcoholic wine. Uh, and so substituted for something else. So the three tips. For those that choose not to have alcohol anymore is your support system, making sure your habit is invisible, unattractive, difficult and unsatisfying and that you swap that habit. Now, it will be a challenge, guys. Your challenges are that it is a, a habit swap. It's an identity shift of who you thought you are and who you're becoming. Initially, initially, you will have challenges perhaps in feeling your feelings. So when stress comes, worry comes, problems come, you've got to sit with them and work them out. So that could be challenging to begin with. It gets better. The other challenge is peer pressure. Notice that. Learn from that. Think about how you'll manage that. Sleep can initially be an issue because you may be saying it helps me sleep and I know some clients have said that to me. It's not true in the reality of the big scheme of things because, what? yes, it can make you go to sleep quick, but then it's a disrupted sleep because you get you wake up and you're dehydrated and that sort of stuff. So really it's not giving you a great sleep. But initially you might think it does. And the other challenge is that you're you may have relied on that 
and therefore when you haven't got it you might think if you might forget how to fall asleep naturally so be kind to yourself understand it's only a short time that that's going to happen and learn how to then go to sleep just learn that strategy again and the same thing with feeling learn to process those feelings in a natural way so there will be challenges I wish I could say to you there wouldn't be I wish I could say it's going to be easy it's not it's going to be a challenge are you up for it because once you get up for that challenge and you go full ball my goodness it's so freaking rewarding and how is it rewarding of course your health you will see changes very, very quickly. You could have weight loss. You could you definitely save money, right? You save a lot of money because alcohol is expensive. It's empowering knowing, shit, I am completely in control of my faculties. I don't have to numb my feelings. I don't have to have a drink to go to sleep I can do this myself I can do life myself and I have clarity of thought and that's freaking empowering and it's empowering being able to say I made this decision regardless of the social pressure that might be around me and the influence the positive influence you can have on those around you is amazing gives you clarity it helps you sleep long term and it's great for every organ of your body, your skin, your hair, your nails, and the performance, your performance as a human being. It helps your performance. So I trust that that's all been valuable for you. And I have a message, and I, I mentioned it before, but I'm going to say this message again. For those of you that are leaders, and I think all of you are, whether you are a coach, whether you are a CEO of a business, whether you are a manager, whether you are a mum, a dad, a grandpa, a grandma, a sister, a teacher. We have a responsibility to others. And, of course, we have a responsibility for ourselves. People are watching us all the time and modelling our behaviour. You remember when you were a kid or maybe you've had kids or you've seen kids model their parents, you know, when they go in and the little kid goes in and puts the shoes on, your shoes on or their parents' shoes on and they run around with their shoes on pretending they're mum and mum or their dad. They're modelling. They see you. They hear you. And even when... They th you think they're not listening or they're not seeing what you're doing. They're always there. And it's not just kids. It's other adults, your friends, your family, those that you love. Everything you do or don't do matters because we always influence others. So how are we influencing others as a leader? On social media, I often see leaders just like what I did when I would have wine o'clock on a Friday and promote that that's okay and promote that that's a good thing. When what I was doing is promoting a toxic substance that is harmful for people's bodies. And I, as a coach, were promoting that five years ago. And I just want you to think as a leader in your life and as a role model for others, be really mindful of what you promote. Be mindful how you look at alcohol and be mindful of how you're a role model for others and how you influence them. So I trust this information has been valuable for you. There is a quote, a passage that I would like to end on that I think is really powerful. And it comes from Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker, 
strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I'll say it one more time. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. That's Proverbs 20, verse 1. Thank you, guys. I hope that this, and I trust that this has been valuable. Please make sure that you comment and share this with anyone that you think is going to have value by listening to this. Thank you, guys. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.